Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Joshua chapter 24, it's in the Old Testament. It's after the first five books of the Bible. So you're gonna turn in the beginning of your Bible and you're gonna go to the sixth book, which is Joshua, in the very end, Joshua, Joshua 24. I got a chance to celebrate this past weekend the birthday of my grandmother, who's 96. 96, check out this picture real quick. Yeah, incredible. So she is 96 years old. And before I left, uh, everyone was leaving and she was waiting and I was getting ready to get in my car and I asked my grandmother, would you give me and my family any advice before we go? Because you just don't know. This could have been her last birthday celebration and I don't know when I'll see her again. And I asked her for some sage advice, some wisdom, and she, she thought for a moment and she looked up at me and she said, Jesus loves you more than you could ever imagine. Simple truth, isn't it? More than you can ever imagine. And then she went on to say, it hurts me to see him on the cross because that was my sin. That was our sin. And that was it. That was it. And I, I took that and I'm, I've been thinking about it, the simplicity of it, but the truth of it and that she loves Jesus so much that she doesn't want to hurt him again by the way she lives. We're in a story here today where Joshua is on the, on the end of his journey in life. He's, he's getting to the time where it's, it's gonna be where he passes away and he is giving the people a heads up uh, of what they need to do to continue to capture the land that God promised the Israelites in Canaan. And he's leaving them, um, and he doesn't know when he's gonna pass away, so he's just making sure that they do everything they can to continue to be faithful to the Lord. And in, in Joshua 23, a little context, he only meets with the leaders of the, of the people first and just pretty much says, if you will be faithful to the Lord, he will continue to help you conquer this land and we will inherit the promise that God gave us. But you must be faithful. And I love that because a good leader speaks to the leaders because as the leader goes, so do the people, right? He, he's such a good leader that he cares about the leader's souls and cares about their obedience. And so he makes sure that the leaders are on track first before he brings in the whole nation of Israel to have a big service and ceremony. And so he double checks and says, be faithful to the Lord. Don't deviate to the right or to the left. Stay straight and follow God's word. Now in Joshua 24, he brings all the people together. And what we're gonna see here is that Joshua is gonna call the people to make a decision. Now we live in a world where there can't be really any gray anymore, can there? God never calls us to be lukewarm. He actually rebukes the church in Revelation for being lukewarm. We have to choose who we're going to worship. I don't know if you've noticed, but I've been saying this for the past four years, that the way the world's going, we're gonna have to make a decision to be very clear where we stand. Who we worship, who we love, who we serve. We're not gonna be able to, to straddle the fence anymore and have one foot in and one foot out. We're gonna have to make a clear choice. And Joshua is doing the same thing in this story in Joshua 24, and I titled this message, As For Me and My House. You know what's next, right? We will serve the Lord. So let's get into Joshua 24. I hope you're ready to do some Bible reading because that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna look into the scripture and, and get an idea of what's going on. So Joshua 24, verse one, then Joshua summoned all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, including their elders, leaders, judges, and officers. So they came and presented themselves to God. Joshua said to the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, long ago your ancestors, including Terah, the fathers of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River and they worshiped other gods. 
But I took your ancestor Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him into the land of Canaan. I gave him many descendants through his son Isaac. To Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. To Esau I gave the mountains of Seir, while Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I brought terrible plagues on Egypt. And afterward, I brought you out as a free people. But when your ancestors arrived at the Red Sea, the Egyptians chased after you with chariots and charioters. When your ancestors cried out to the Lord, I put darkness between you and the Egyptians. I brought the sea crashing down on the Egyptians, drowning them. With your very own eyes, you saw what I did. Then you lived in the wilderness for many years. Finally, I brought you into the land of the Amorites on the east side of the Jordan. They fought against you, but I destroyed them before you. I gave you victory over them, and you took possession of their land. Then Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab, started a war against Israel. He summoned Balaam, son of Beor, to curse you, but I would not listen to him. Instead, I made Balaam bless you, and so I rescued you from Balak. When you crossed the Jordan River and came to Jericho, the men of Jericho fought against you, as did the Amorites, Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, and Girgashites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. But I gave you victory over them, and I sent terror. Some of your translations may say hornet. There's an argument and scholars over what that means. Interesting uh, research online, by the way. And I sent terror ahead of you to drive out the two kings of the Amorites, it was not your swords or bows that brought you victory. I gave you land you had not worked on, and I gave you towns you did not build, the towns where you are now living. I gave you vineyards and olive groves for food, though you did not plant them. I'm going to stop right there. Let me just share a little context to help us understand what we're reading. Uh, they're in Shechem, and Shechem holds a significant uh, history with the Israelites. This is actually where Abraham first received the promise from God that his, his lineage would receive the promised land. This is also where idols were cast down. Jacob stopped at Shechem on his return from Padan Aram and buried there the idols his family had in possession of them. And after the Israelites completed their first conquest uh, in Canaan with Joshua, they journeyed to Shechem where Joshua built a altar to Yahweh, to God. And on this altar, he inscribed the law. And then we also see that in this journey, Joshua had good reason, therefore, to use this area as a, as a re remembrance, as a uh, serving as a reminder of the faithfulness of God. And he says, here is where we're going to remember what God has done. So serving, at, anyone have like a place where it, has, it holds a lot of memories, where your life was changed? I know for me in youth ministry, there was a place over in our NPR, our kids' room, where God changed my life. Every once in a while, I'll go back to that spot and I'll pray to God just to remember where, where I've come from as a teenager. When we read this scripture, we're actually reading Joshua delivering a prophecy from God. If you notice, it says, I did this, I did that. 18 plus times, God is speaking, saying, I did these things. It is because of the grace and the enablement of God that the Israelites are even where they are today. And what jo Joshua is doing, he's prophesying a review, a recall of the faithfulness of God through many different ordeals. And this is only a short one. Sometimes there's longer ones in scripture, but it's a review of all that God has done for them. Like God birthed a nation from Abraham's an ancestors. God did not forget their suffering in Egypt, the slaves for 400 years, and he delivered them. God performed miracles to give them victory in battles they could not win without him. When an enemy was trying to use a wicked prophet to curse them, God flipped it and used that wicked prophet to bless them. God didn't just give them barren land to build upon and start fresh. No, he gave them buildings already built and land full of food for them to survive immediately, blessing them tremendously as soon as they got into the promised land. So Joshua is reminding the people, this is the God that we have been serving. Don't forget that. Don't forget where we've come from. Amen? Amen. So he goes into verse 14 and 15, and he says this, so fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. 
So he comes out of this prophecy of God. He's, he's not necessarily um, speaking on behalf of God in this moment. He turns now, although you could still say God want him to, want, wants him to say this. He says, so fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. Put away forever the idols your ancestors worship when they live beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Serve the Lord alone. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates? Or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? But as for me and my family or my house, we will serve the Lord. What does it mean to serve the Lord alone? First of all, when he says this, to, to fear him and serve him wholeheartedly, it means to follow God and his word, his ways, and no other book. Don't follow the stars. They don't tell you a thing. Unless you're, you know, out in the ocean and you need to find true north or something like that, that's great. But the stars are not going to tell you your future and who you're going to marry. I just got, I got bad news for you. They don't work. Don't follow other gods. Follow the one true God. Follow his word. Obey him. Do what he asks you to do. Don't do what any other nation wants you to do. Now, why would this be a struggle for them? Because they were surrounded by nations who worshiped many gods. So it was tempting and enticing for them. So Joshua was just making sure. And he says, look, just choose. Choose. If it's going to be, if it's not going to be God, then choose who you're going to serve. But quit being wishy-washy and, and choosing all these different gods and being polytheistic, having many gods. Instead, choose who you're going to serve. But I tell you what, as for me and my house, I don't care what you guys do. I don't care what the large crowd does. I don't, I'm not persuaded by the majority. This is what our family is going to do. We're going to serve the Lord. Can you feel that? Yes. Joshua wasn't going to be persuaded by the majority of the crowd, the loudness of the crowd. He was going to do whatever God said he should do. He saw the faithfulness of God. He saw God do miracles. None of these idols did it that they have in their possession. None of these false gods got them out of slavery after 400 years and got them through terrible uh, battles that they could have easily lost. No, God the almighty God, El Shaddai, got them through. And Joshua is just giving credit where credit is due and saying, that's who we are going to serve. Praise the Lord. Now, Joshua 24, 16 through 28. He takes them through this renewal ceremony of their commitment. Every once in a while, it needs to happen, actually. And it and, and does happen multiple times in scripture. There's a renewal of the covenant between God and the people. Now, the, God has not, God doesn't break his covenant. The promised land is yours. Only if, though, they, co they commit and do their part of the covenant. It's up to them. Do what I say, and it's all yours. Don't do what I say, and it's not yours. This is why this is really important for Joshua. Before he leaves the earth, he wants to make sure that they get what God has promised them. Because he cares about them. He cares about his children having the promised land as well. So let's go to verse 16. The people replied, we would never abandon the Lord and serve other gods. For the Lord our God is the one who rescued us and our ancestors from slavery in the land of Egypt. He performed mighty miracles before our very eyes. As we traveled through the wilderness among our enemies, he preserved us. It was the Lord who drove out the Amorites and the other nations living, there, living here in the land. So we too will serve the Lord, for he alone is our God. Okay, so they're like recapping as well, saying, yep, we agree with you. But then Joshua says something that kind of baffles a lot of people. Joshua warned the people, you are not able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy and jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you abandon the Lord and serve other gods, he will turn against you and destroy you, even though he has been so good to you. Whoa, what is going on here? Because God's a forgiving God. God's a, a loving God and God's a patient God. What he's saying here is, is and he's about to reveal some, some truth here, that they actually still deal with idol worship. And that you say these things, but your actions don't prove it. 
And so God can see through your words and see your heart and your heart isn't obedient. Your words sound like it, but your heart, it says other. If you're gonna be faithful now, if you're gonna commit to God to serve him now, then there's gotta be some physical changes with the idols and the gods in your life right now. That's what he's saying. So if this isn't the final word here. If they remove the things in their life that are wrong, they will be faithful and God will be faithful to them. But if not, they're in trouble. They're in trouble. So let's keep going to help us with the context. Verse 21, but the people answered Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. You are a witness to your own decision, Joshua said. You have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, they replied. We are witnesses to what we have said. All right then, Joshua said, destroy the idols among you and turn your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. See, there it is. Words are cheap. If you truly will serve the Lord, you will make, he's saying to, these, to his people, you will make a change in your life and you will remove the things that you're serving instead. Instead of God, you'll remove those things. And they, they would be faithful if that's the case. God sees past the words and sees our hearts. It's a tough word from the leader, isn't it? Verse 24, the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God. We will serve and obey him alone. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day at Shechem committing them to follow the decrees and regulations of the Lord. Joshua recorded these things in the book of God's instructions as a reminder of their agreement. He took a huge stone and rolled it beneath the terebinth tree beside the tabernacle of the Lord. And Joshua said to all the people, this stone has heard everything the Lord said to us, not literally, figuratively. It will be a witness to testify against you if you go back on your word to God. Then Joshua sent all the people away to their homelands. So now every time they walk by this road, they remember that rock serves as a witness, as a reminder that they made a decision to abandon all idols, all their gods, and serve God alone. Sometimes we need crossroad moments like that in our lives too, right? I gave my life to God. When I was a kid, I believed in Jesus Christ at five years old. When I was 12... I gave my life to serve God alone. I realized that I needed to give my life to God. And that's when God actually called me into ministry when I was 12 years old at a youth service. Only took an hour and a half, God got me. God got me. Now you could say the, the seeds planted for years, but it was there in that moment that I chose to serve God alone. What it meant for them was we have to make a decision today. We have to renew our commitment and make a decision that we're not going to look anywhere else at any other gods, any other nations, and who they serve, and we're going to keep our eyes above on who God serves. Don't we live in a world where we're tempted to really give our hearts and attention to so many other things? There's so many other things that people say, trust this, do this, you'll be okay. Trust this person, trust this new program. Trust this way of thinking. There's only one God. And there's only one person we can trust, and that's Jesus Christ. What can we do? What can we apply? Actually, let me, let me give you a little real quick, uh, before we get into that, let me just tell you what actually happens next. Judges chapter two, if you would, turn a couple pages over in your Bibles. I won't have it on the screen because I'm just going to do this here um, to help us before we transition to help you understand what happens next. I didn't have it on the screen for you. Joshua 2, verse 6. After Joshua sent the people away, each of, each of the tribes left to take possession of the land allotted to them. And just so you know, all the land had not been conquered yet. They still have not driven out all the pagan evil nations that God wanted them to drive out yet. So that's another reason why Joshua really needed them to commit to this because they needed to drive out everyone so that they couldn't be infiltrated by their gods and evil things. So the Israelites served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and the leaders who outlived him, those who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Praise the Lord. So they, they stayed committed. 
They served the Lord. And from the time Joshua died and the leaders with him, and as they, as they um, outlived Joshua and they died, the people of God served the Lord. But verse 10 says something else. After that generation died, another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things he had done for Israel. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight and served the images of Baal. They abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors who had brought them out of Egypt. They went after other gods, worshiping the gods of the people around them, and they angered the Lord. They abandoned the Lord to serve Baal and the images of Ashtoreth. This made the Lord burn with anger against Israel, so he handed them over to raiders who stole their possessions. He turned them over to their enemies all around, and they were no longer able to resist them. And this is where it's really sad and scary. In verse 15, every time Israel went out to battle, the Lord fought against them, causing them to be defeated, just as he had warned, and the people were in great distress. What we have here is, is God is humbling them so that they would turn back to him, repent and remove those things that they're worshiping that have infiltrated their lives. And he'll do that. He'll allow a crumbling so that we will be humbled and repent. But here's the bottom line I saw in this scripture. We need to pass down God to the next generation in our families. It's not enough to assume that because they watched us or they went to church with us, however much we go to church, that they know what God has done in history past and even present. We have a need in our community, in our schools, where kids need Jesus because their parents don't even have Jesus. So imagine that. So this is, a, this is the God's people and they didn't pass down to the next generation properly to serve God alone and they abandoned God. So there was something missing there. It didn't translate, it didn't transfer to the next generation. And we don't know, you know what they could have done better. We can't judge them. We can't come to any conclusions, but all we do know, um, or assumptions, but all we do know is that they did not pass it down properly. And because of that, they did abandon the Lord. So what can we do? How can we apply this to our day and our time? Because things have changed. Okay, we're not conquering lands. <laughs> Jesus died on the cross for us and all those things. But are we still supposed to serve God and God alone? Yes. So let me give you just a few things to take away. And I pray that God will help you uh, live this out to help your family blueprints continue to be on the Lord. Number one, I think we have an obvious choice. There's no God like our God. I don't think that we should be confused about any other God or any other deity that might be out there. We have the one and only true deity, Jesus Christ. We have, they didn't even have the revelation of Christ yet. We have the Old Testament and the New Testament that tells us that Jesus lives. Jesus is the only way. In fact, one day when Jesus was with his disciples and he preached a really tough message, a bunch of them abandoned him and this is what he asked them. He said, are you also going to leave? Are you gonna leave me now too? And Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. Listen, church, I don't have anywhere else to go. It's Jesus or nothing. It's Jesus for me. And it's not, that, it's not that I haven't done research or looked at other ways or other things. No, I have. Jesus is the only way. He has validated that. There's been 300 fulfilled prophecies of the life of Christ that were prophesied in the Old Testament and he, and he fulfilled around 300 of them during his lifetime alone, which is incapable of being done mathematically or scientifically and all the other E's. There is no other answer but Jesus. And then, if that's not enough, we have the Holy Spirit who Jesus sent to us, who comes and lives in us and helps us live the right way to worship God alone. And I have felt and seen the Holy Spirit work. Do you think the Holy Spirit was working for that mother who came on Saturday out of nowhere? Do you think that happened by accident or was it by God? 
The Holy Spirit drew her to this place. The Holy Spirit had us have a date for this event on this day because there's gonna be an ordained time where she meets God, where she sees a church reaching out to her. Okay, that God is working through his spirit and that's proof for me as well. There is no other choice but Jesus Christ. If you're on the fence today about who you and your family serve, I would challenge you just because of that reason, make a choice. Then we need to consider serving the Lord today. Serve the Lord with your whole life. I know I say this stuff a lot, but I'm just gonna reiterate what is true, what is needed. To say you serve God is one thing, but to reorient your life to match that is another thing. So what are some ways we can reorient our, life, our lives to serve him? We can serve the Lord inward. All right, so inward, upward, and outward. So we can serve the Lord in our hearts and our minds when we worship him, and upward when we worship him, and outward when we use our hands. We have the head, the heart, and the hands, amen? Do you think that the Lord should get your worship just on Sunday morning? He should get your worship after you leave on Sunday morning too. He should get my worship tonight. He should get my worship tomorrow morning. He should get my entire life. See, when the Israelites were corrected a lot in the Old Testament, God saw that they only did what they were supposed to do when it came time for sacrifice time, but they weren't being obedient before that. And God would rebuke and correct the Israelites again and again. This is, yeah, I, I see the lamb, I see the, the, the bleeding animals, I hear their, their bleeding sounds, I hear them, you know, making their animal sounds, but where's your heart, where's your worship before this? I ask for obedience, not just sacrifice. That's what he calls the Israelites to do. Our whole lives are to be a living sacrifice, pleasing and obedient to the Lord. One of the things we can do as well is we can remove what isn't godly and add what is godly into our lives. What is it that God would ask you to remove that you've been looking to more than him? What is it that God has been asking for us to trust him in instead of trusting other things? What about seeking and serving God's will for your life instead of asking God to serve your will in this life? Think about that for a second. One of the things I had to do is I had to say, Lord, what is your will for my life? Not let me bring my desires and wills to God and say, bless them. Don't we have that backwards? Am I being too hard first time back in a few weeks? just being obedient to the Lord today. Uh, I have to go, God, what is your will? And I mean about anything. What's your will today? What's your will for this purchase? Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't think you have to ask, you know, should I buy this water bottle or not? If you're thirsty, get the water bottle. I'm not mean that. I'm not going that far, but Lord, what's your will for my job? What's your will for me at my job today? What do you want me to do today? How can I be a light? in my workplace today? You know, what's the Lord's will? Not, I, I think a lot of times we come up with plans and then we ask God to bless them. And meanwhile, he's like, that's not my plans. I can't bless them. So let's reverse it and get back to seeking what God wants. Uh, our commitment to worshiping him in our everyday lives. Do we serve and love God in some way, shape or form in our homes? Not just here at church, in our community. What about our commitment to church? Do we make being together with the church and serving one another a priority? Did you know that, that serving one another is a key command in the New Testament that we love and serve one another in the body of Christ? Did you know that? It's, it's a key scriptures or key lessons and key scriptures that we be the body and that we use our gifts to love and serve one another. How many people could use some encouragement before they leave today? How many people could use some prayer before they leave today? God calls us to do that here and outside these walls as well. Does God get our resources? Remember uh, Pastor Isaac's message last week, what's in your hands? Couldn't forget that question, right? 
Do we practice tithing and offerings to the Lord's work? Does our kids see us giving to the Lord's work? Does our kids see us tithing? Are we teaching our kids to tithe and give offerings to the Lord? Are we passing that on to the next generation? The serving, the worship, the obedience, the giving to the work of the Lord. How many of us spend so much money on Comcast, Xfinity, Verizon, Wawa gas and coffee, you know, mortgages, car payments, insurance. We make sure we get all that covered. Does God get covered with his work? Will, will, will the Chris and Katie Seals and the missionaries and the pastors and the churches have the funds to do the work of the Lord? Or are we gonna continue to fund Comcast CEOs so they can have three yachts, you know? I don't know if they have three yachts. They probably only have two, who knows? <laughs> they're, they're probably already searching for another one from Jeff Bezos, Amazon guy who has a huge one. I don't know. I mean, you, you, you see what I'm saying? Like, and, the, and here's the thing, if the world, the world is most likely not gonna give their money to the Lord's work. So we, the people, must step up and do that as the, as the body of Christ. But are we gonna teach our children to do these things? If we are, we actually have to practice them first. So they see it's not just what we say with our mouth, but it's actually the heart and it's what we actually do all the time. Does our kids see us serving, giving and singing to God, worshiping God and loving others around us and speaking the truth of Jesus Christ, the good news. So how about this? Um, my house belongs to the Lord. My car belongs to the Lord. My weekdays, my weekends, my Sundays belong to the Lord. God gets it all. He gets my social media accounts. He gets my bank account. He gets it all. If God, has, if God wants me to do something, I'm gonna do it. Just recently, I felt compelled to give a little gift to a family that I love just to help them have fun on their vacation. And it was, um, I was getting ready to go on our vacation and the Lord put on my heart to send them through the cash app, a little gift to help them to have a dinner out together as a family while they're gone. And would you know, two days later, someone comes knocking on our door at our house and gives right back to us. You can't write that. I mean, I can't invent that. That's God. We get a ding dong. What are you doing here? We wanted you to have a good time on your vacation. Right? Praise the Lord. So guess what? I'm telling my kids those stories. I'm, I'm, having, I'm bringing my son to, to work and serve at the church, to work and to serve in the community, and my daughter too, and my wife, and we're all in, church, because as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. <laughs> Moving forward. <laughs> so we gotta teach the next generation. I'm almost done, hang tight. It's been a while, you know, I just gotta get us all. <laughs> we, can keep, uh, we can keep lamenting and people watching this young generation who's hurting and struggling or we can start doing something about it. We can, we can keep you know, watching on news or seeing out in public, teens and young adults you know, do terrible things and we can keep lamenting about it. Man, this is terrible, where's their parents, yada yada, all that stuff, we can keep doing that. Or we can start changing the few that are in this church right now. We can start mentoring those in the schools through CEF and Good News Club. We can step up and say, you know what? I'm not just gonna lament, I'm gonna help transform the next generation. That's what we could do. Like right now, Pastor Brandon and Pastor John, so Pastor Brandon's in charge of the teens and Pastor John's in charge of the kids. They're looking for adults who love the Lord and will help teach the next generation about Jesus Christ. There's never a shortage of volunteers in those ministries. We can change the next generation, but we're gonna have to get close to them because that's what Jesus did. 
Jesus came alongside us and changed us, taught us, and then left us with the Holy Spirit so that we're fully capable of continuing the mission for every generation to transform them to be followers of Jesus Christ. And so we're gonna have to, you know, roll up the sleeves and do something. Yes, we can pray, praise the Lord. We can give to the church to help other people do this work. But we also have been blessed with abilities and giftings and also just love and time and patience to minister to the next generation. So if, if that's you, let us know at the Connect Center, even today, or go to the CEF interest meeting um, and let, let them share what they're doing for the community. If God has been nudging on your heart to get involved and make a difference, that's God, right? It's not the Chinese you had last night <laughs> or whatever else you, disturbs your stomach. If you're getting a little nervous because you feel like something's pulling you, it, it's probably God saying, it's time. You know scripture, you pray, you attend church, you have abilities. There's so many kids and teens that need examples and mentors in their life. Can you tell I used to be a youth pastor for 11 years? Because <laughs> here's the thing, I don't know how many adult leaders I had in the ministry who they thought they could never do it and then when they started doing it, they're like, oh, this isn't that bad. I'm like, nope. Teenagers just need someone to be there when they need them. And they need examples of, of being patient, being like Christ, you know, praying for them, listening to them. You know how many teens just need someone to talk to? Or text, unfortunately. <laughs> Lots of text messages, you know. I mean, they just need that in their life. Hey, thanks for that message. Let me, here's a scripture I just read today. Here's a scripture I just read today. I hope it helps you, um, buddy. Boom. Kids at home crying because that scripture is exactly what he needed. This is the kind of stuff that happens all the time. It's all it takes. I mean, there's more to it. I don't want to get in trouble with Pastor Brandon or John, Pastor John, because there is more to it. There's serving. There's being here committed to it. But we, we can change the next generation, church. We can pass down Jesus to the next generation. And lastly, persevere persevere. As we can see in, in scripture and even in this world, in this life, making a decision to worship the Lord is not a one-time decision, it's a daily decision. And as much as you are trying to serve the Lord and worship him, the devil is trying to get you not to. In fact, when you commit to going all in for the Lord, that's exactly when you're gonna fight opposition from the enemy right away. Expect opposition when you follow Jesus. Expect difficulty. Oh man, as soon as I started serving the Lord, everything went bad, yup. Pretty sure Jesus was crucified, but he was serving the Lord. I'm pretty sure every apostle was persecuted, but they were serving the Lord. But their reward they have a crown in heaven. There's a crown waiting for you because you stay faithful, persevere, and serve the Lord. So look, I mean, maybe, let's stand together and pray. Maybe in your family, things have gotten a little lazy. Maybe, just, maybe it's just you and the spouse, okay? Kids have moved on. Guess what though? Your house still should serve the Lord, right? And the house meant household. It didn't mean like physical house, but I dedicate my home to the Lord. And I've been using it for him. But the household, your household, what can you do for the Lord? It's serving him inwardly, so personally, and it's serving him relationally with your family, and it's serving him publicly or with the church. Hmm. I sense that there's people in this room right now and I, right now it's just one that's in my heart but you've been so beaten down been through so much you don't feel like you could do anything for the Lord that's a lie from the devil you know when we follow Jesus the grace of Jesus Christ is with you you don't even realize how much you can do until you follow in the footsteps of Jesus and he gives you the power to do what pleases him and what he's called us to do God is not done with you yet. 
God is not done with you yet. Today, in your home, even if you need to do it with your family or with your spouse or even by yourself, choose. Because really, church, time is short. It's time. It's time. There's, there cannot be any gray area Christians, lukewarm Christians. We got to choose today whom we serve. Because there's another generation depending on us to not make it confusing. Let's pray. Lord, as for me, as for us, and our houses, our homes, our families, we choose to serve you. There's no other option. There's no plan B. I've seen your faithfulness. I've seen your goodness. And no matter how hard it gets, I will serve you. And I will teach my kids and my family to serve you too. And God, we need your spirit to help us. We need your help. We can't do our own. We're admitting right now. We're humbling ourselves to say we're not perfect. We don't do it right all the time. And we need your help. We need your guidance. And God, we're scared or nervous to serve or to do things for people or to, to get involved in the mission. Lord, we're admitting that. If that's in us, Lord, and we ask God that you remove that fear and give us the confidence in Christ that he is leading the way, that he is with us, that we can do this. That God, you will show us how to serve in our community, in our church. Help us, Lord, to not live in the gray, to not straddle the fence any longer, but to serve you and you alone. Help us, Lord. Teach us and show us this week what that looks like. We thank you, Lord, for this challenging word pray it would be a, a change in our families and our church, our community. All for your glory, not for our own. To point everyone to you. We love you, God. We thank you for your faithfulness. We're so grateful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Wow. God bless you guys. It's good to be back. I'll see you next week. Have a great week. God bless you.